going to talk to you about um, a somewhat forgotten figure uh, in American political history, uh, Wendell Wilkie, um, who was the Republican uh, presidential nominee in uh, 1940. But <clears throat> before I talk about Wilkie, I want you all to uh, suspend your disbelief for a moment. OK, I want you to imagine that the Republican Party uh, nominates a businessman of German-American extraction with no political experience. Uh, he's a known adulterer and he's taken on a very popular uh, Democratic president. Uh, he basically hijacks the Republican Party. So if you can imagine something like that ever happening, then you're kind of where Wend Wendell Wilkie was in 1940. So how does this happen? How does this guy who is an amateur um, has never held political office, who was a registered Democrat as late as 1938, how does he end up as the Republican nominee in 1940? And then what does he do beyond uh, 1940 uh, with what turns out to be a brief political career? Okay, so uh, I've chosen this photograph uh, really because it's, it's from Wilkie when he was at college uh, the college debating team, but I've really chosen it because he looks like Killian Murphy in Peaky Blinders. Uh, I thought the uh, the resemblance was striking on this. But anyway, a bit of background on Wilkie. He's from Indiana, so he was known as a Hoosier or Hoosier, um, so sometimes known as a Hoosier internationalist. Uh, unlike a president of uh, later vintage, he did actually serve in the military. He signed up on the day America declared war uh, as a private. Uh, he made it to first lieutenant, uh, but by the time he got to France, uh, the war had ended. Uh, he uh, went to law school and rose very quickly in um, uh, the, uh, the business world. Uh, went to New York eventually becomes president of the Southern Commonwealth and Energy Company. And this is where his feud with uh, Franklin Roosevelt occurs. Uh, not unlike a lot of people in America in the 1930s, there, was, there, there were those, although Roosevelt was hugely popular, two landslide victories, there were those who felt that he was assuming too much power and concentrating in his own hands in the hands of the federal government. And uh, Wilkie and others felt that this was bad for free enterprise, that free enterprise and companies like his shouldn't have to compete with the government. So he objected to what was called the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a hydroelectric project uh, bringing um, uh, electricity to much of the South. Uh, eventually the federal government um, uh, settled uh, with Wilkie, I think, uh, for something like $76 million, which is a huge amount today and was an absolutely astronomical amount in the 1930s. As I mentioned, he was registered as a Democrat as late as 1938. Um, now, I said he had no political experience, but he did have some, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, but I think the point to make here and the point that's, that this kind of dogged him as a, as a Republican politician is that he wasn't a Republican. Um, the Republicans are something of a vehicle for him. Um, he kind of falls out with them. And uh, as we'll see, he's actually got much more in common with uh, Roosevelt in terms of his, his uh, outlook on uh, politics um, and the international situation in particular. In 1939, uh, Arthur Crock of the New York Times was the first to identify uh, Wilkie as a potential presidential candidate. And actually, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good um, bet by Crock, as it turns out. But he called him the darkest horse. Now, part of the reason that someone like Wilkie even had a chance in 1940 is because the Republican Party was hugely divided over the course of the 1930s. And actually threatened to disintegrate after its massive uh, electoral uh, election defeats in 1930 and 1932, 19, uh, sorry, 1932 and 1936. In 1936, uh, the Republicans carried, um, I think it was two states. Um, I think it was Maine and 
Kansas or somewhere. So uh, the Republicans were uh, were obliterated in the previous two presidential elections, uh, and uh, they had no proper focus, no policies, no response to the New Deal. Um, what they did have in uh, 1940 was an isolationist wing, uh, and as I'll discuss in a moment, even that uh, was going to prove an, elect an electoral liability. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention about Wilkie when I might have been comparing him to someone of a more recent vintage was that he was also a bit of a media celebrity. Um, he was on the equivalent of a kind of have I got news for you um, type panel show on the radio called Information Please. And he was quite a quite a popular um, uh, quite a popular panelist on that. And that actually got him to a much wider audience. He was, he was already known as the businessman who took on uh, Roosevelt, um, but this got his, literally got his voice out uh, to the American people. And I'll come back to this quotation um, as well. One of his biographers, and unlike a lot of presidential candidates, um, there are at least half a dozen, maybe 10 biographies of uh, Wilkie. Uh, this is one of the earliest and one of the most sympathetic by a journalist called Joseph Barnes, who called Wilkie a crusader for the common welfare with a few dangerously liberal ideas. And I think I'll be able to demonstrate both the fact that he was a crusader for the common welfare and some of these dangerous ideas, uh, dangerously liberal ideas. As I mentioned, uh, he was a bit of a philanderer. Um, his uh, best known mistress, well, Possible one of his top two best known mistresses, and I'll come back to another one uh, later in the talk, was Irina Van Doren, who was um, previously married to um, uh, a journalist called Carl Van Doren. Um, she was a journalist, very well known, well respected journalist in her own right. And Wilkie was kind of open about this, as, as you're probably aware, Roosevelt had a mistress, a lot of presidents. Um, you know, up to Kennedy had mistresses. Uh, and Wilkie said that this, uh, this was well enough known and he didn't think uh, journalists would reveal it. So confident on this was he that he actually held press conferences from Irita Van Doren's hotel suite uh, at the Astoria Waldorf in New York. Uh, so different times, I think, in terms of um, uh, the morality of uh, politicians. So um, a crusader for the common welfare with a few dangerously liberal ideas. How come? Well, Wilkie had a reputation uh, for liberalism. His uh, grandparents had fled Germany um, at the time of the 1848 uh, revolution and they instilled this kind of love of uh, freedom and democracy. Um, uh, his mother was um, a lawyer, um, so uh, he comes from a, uh, a fairly uh, educated background. His liberalism is really demonstrated uh, in 1924. Now I said that he hadn't got political experience, but it doesn't mean he wasn't a political activist. He was a delegate from Ohio. Uh, he moved to Akron, Ohio, and he was a delegate at the Democratic National Convention in 1924. Um, Democrats were deeply divided in the 1920s uh, after um, the election of 1920, the death, uh, the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. But one of the big issues in the mid 1920s in politics was the influence of the Ku Klux Klan. 1926, uh, there's famous, infamous photo of the uh, Ku Klux Klan parading in Washington DC uh, without a word of complaint from President Calvin Coolidge. Um, but the Klan had infiltrated the Democratic Party. Actually, you could argue the Democratic Party infiltrated the Klan, um, given uh, its history uh, after the Civil War. But liberals, Northern liberals like Wilkie, objected to the Klan in the Democratic Party. Now, actually, at this point, just as an aside, the Klan was really strong in places like Ohio and Wilkie's home state of uh, Indiana. So he and uh, a kind of insurgency of uh, liberal delegates tried to uh, get the Klan censured at, uh, the, um, at the Democratic Convention. I think they came within one vote of doing this. Also, 
uh, they wanted support for the League of Nations. So again, this idea of Wilkie as an internationalist, um, and this has a bearing on his uh, later politics. He said this uh, in retrospect, um, uh, the fight against intolerance we won. I consider that it was an absolute repudiation of the Klan by this convention. Um, and it does mark, even though he does become a Republican, it marks a change in the Democratic Party's attitude towards uh, the Klan and actually its Southern white uh, segregationist wing. His brother um, later reflected, I think this was to one of Wilkie's biographers, that Wilkie spent a year um, campaigning against the Klan um, in Ohio, um, setting aside his law practice to do so. Uh, so when you kind of go back and look at Wilkie, some of what he advocates later on is less of a surprise um, when you look at his early uh, political involvement. Um, and I suppose one of the things I should also stress is that uh, the comparison with the current incumbent of the White House kind of ends with the German-American businessman adulterer thing. They're really very different in all sorts of ways, not least the fact that uh, Wilkie doesn't win the election. Okay, so what's the context of the Wilkie candidacy? Um, well, partly it's to do with the New Deal. Um, uh, Roosevelt's been in office for eight years. Uh, the New Deal has broadly speaking, taken America out of uh, the Great Depression. Uh, there has been, as I mentioned, uh, some concern that the New Deal is becoming um, too powerful. It's becoming almost totalitarian. Now, looking back on it, this might seem slightly absurd, but do bear in mind that this kind of state intervention was unknown in American history. And uh, what you have elsewhere and, um, and it's a bit of an exaggeration, but the, the analogies would have been made by some people was you have uh, state involvement in the Soviet Union, state involvement in Germany. Uh, and again, you have that, that kind of fear that Roosevelt is gonna establish himself as a dictator. Um, now, Roosevelt was not going to do that, but another fear certainly articulated by Republicans was that if Roosevelt didn't uh, abuse the powers that he was, that he was uh, given, another president would and that president would actually be Richard Nixon. 1940 is crucial to this. Uh, America was divided between isolationists and interventionists or internationalists. The Republican Party was an isolationist party, um, as it had really been since uh, the First World War. Um, the fall of France in June 1940 starts to shift uh, American public opinion. Now, the Republicans have been running their primary campaign um, in the early part of 1940, and all the candidates and all the candidates who uh, were going to be nominated were isolationists. But the mood of the, the, mood of the public was shifting away from this. And um, the thinking was that an isolationist can't get elected. It's difficult enough to run against a really popular president in Roosevelt, but an isolationist would simply have no chance. So that's part of um, why Wilkie is able to uh, able to, to make headway within the party. The party, as I mentioned, was split throughout the 1930s. It was split between a conservative wing and a progressive wing. Now, the Republican Party is not a party that we currently associate with progressivism, um, but there was a progressive uh, wing in the party really up until the 1960s. One of uh, Wilkie's rivals uh, for the nomination in 1940, and the guy that ran in 44 and 48 was Thomas Dewey, who was a liberal governor of New York, uh, liberal on things like uh, race, uh, racism and, and civil rights and so forth. So the Republican Party throughout this period is hopelessly divided, trying to find a direction, trying to find an alternative to the New Deal, um, which partly explains why an outsider like Wilkie can come into it. Um, and again, this is centered around isolationism versus interventionism. Uh, the fear, certainly in places like the Midwest, that uh, Roosevelt's going to drag America into another war. Um, and uh, finally, um, the third term. Now, the precedent of um, the American political system was that presidents only stand for two terms. Uh, it wasn't enshrined in law. It wouldn't be until after Roosevelt's death, but Roosevelt was running for a third term. Um, and this, if you think about this, this slightly 
if you like the slightly paranoid uh, view of American politics at the time, this is another indication that Roosevelt is trying to establish himself as a dictator um, or a president for life. So uh, Roosevelt is going against the third term tradition. Now there's an argument that had the international situation been uh, a bit more stable, that Roosevelt wouldn't have run. Um, but this does cause consternation um, um, in the population and actually within his own Democratic Party uh, as well. Um, here we have uh, Wilkie with Thomas Dewey. Um, just a couple of things about Thomas Dewey. Um, he was a prosecutor in New York. He was quite young at the, uh, when he tried to run in uh, 1940, I think he was about 37 or 38, so he would have been one of the youngest presidents had he, uh, had he won. Uh, prosecutor in New York, he um, uh, broke up organized crime in New York, uh, but he was described by one journalist as uh, looking like the bridegroom on a wedding cake. Uh, he was also described as being able to strut sitting down, so he had a, he had a fairly, uh, fairly high opinion of himself. Okay, so Wilkie doesn't run in the Republican primaries. Um, Dewey does, Robert Taft does, John Bricker does, uh, but Wilkie doesn't run. So there's no party machinery around Wilkie uh, running in the primaries. But what Wilkie does do, um, uh, he and his backers pack the, pack the convention with Wilkie supporters. So not on the floor of the convention. I'm going to show you a, uh, um, a clip in a moment of the convention, but they're in the um, uh, in the arena, uh, in the uh, the balconies around it. So Wilkie packs the convention with his supporters. His campaign also floods the convention with uh, telegrams and letters and so on to uh, delegates. Now this is guess is what we would call now call an astroturf campaign. Um, so but what it's trying to do is give the impression of a groundswell of popular support for Wilkie. Now there's a kind of cause and effect here. Wilkie was popular and um, his campaign energized a lot of people but uh, this, is, this, this, is, this is not how you go about it in uh, American politics. Um, he also benefits from the fact that the Republicans are so badly split. So uh, there is still, at a modern convention, you know who the candidate's going to be months before uh, the convention happens, and it's really just a rubber stamp. But at this point, uh, the convention still chose the candidate. Uh, and because it was split between three main candidates, and I think there might have been um, what we would call a favorite son candidate, in other words, a candidate who's symbolically there from the state, um, which is hosting the convention. In this case, it would have been um, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, no one's pulling ahead. Um, so the, Dewey was something of an outsider. Robert Taft was kind of, a, kind of the favorite because he was the most experienced. His father had been president um, and he had the, the soundest uh, conservative credentials. But with every ballot, Wilkie starts to creep up. Uh, someone gets eliminated, Wilkie wins more um, votes. And the regular Republicans can't agree on a candidate. Uh, they can't bring in another candidate to try and head off Wilkie. And the momentum just shifts uh, with Wilkie. And on the sixth ballot, he uh, wins the nomination. So I want to show you this clip. Uh, it's from YouTube, so hopefully... There won't be um, adverts, but we'll uh, see how we get on. Okay, so you get a sense of the uh, this kind of furore at the uh, Republican convention. Um, Wilkie's supporters up in the balcony, uh, trouble on the floor, and um, this sort of sense of the momentum uh, following uh, Wilkie. Um, so I think there's an argument that Wilkie stole the nomination. Um, he's not a Republican, he didn't run in the primaries, and he stuffed uh, the convention. Um, but it worked, and uh, uh, he becomes the Republicans' uh, nominee to take on uh, Roosevelt. 
Um, now, not all the Republicans were particularly happy with this. And this is one of my favorite quotes, um, actually probably about any, pop, any politician. Uh, this is from an Indiana Senator called James Watson. Um, so, you know, Wendell, it's all right if the town whore joins the church, but they don't let her lead the choir on the first night. Uh, this kind of reflected uh, some of the, uh, the concerns, let's say, that the Republicans had about um, Wilkie's motivation um, and uh, his, uh, the, the, the extent to which he was fit uh, for the Republican uh, nomination. Um, now, I want to take a slight diversion uh, for a moment and talk about this. Um, uh, the Plot Against America by Philip Roth, um, which is a counterfactual history of the 1940 election, which substitutes uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, for uh, Wendell Wilkie. So rather than having an internationalist uh, Republican, you have an isolationist. Uh, Charles Lindbergh obviously is part of America First, a link to the German-American Bund, and so on. Um, what Roth does in the novel is he has the Republican convention basically hijacked by Lindbergh in the way that Wilkie hijacked it to the extent that uh, Lindbergh's supporters are chanting, we want Lindy. Um, and uh, uh, Lindbergh becomes president, he appeases Germany, passes anti-Jewish laws, um, and uh, it's, it's made into an HBO uh, series, uh, which was out earlier this year. Um, so an interesting uh, examination of counterfactual history. Okay, so the 1940 campaign. There's an element of chaos that surrounds Wilkie in 1940. A journalist was on his campaign train on the days before uh, uh, the, the candidates would fly across the states. They do whistle stop tours on trains. And a journalist who found himself on, on uh, Wilkie's train said it was like being in a whorehouse on a Saturday night when the man was out. Um, I'm not sure anyone asked the journalist how he knew this, but I think everyone got what he was getting at uh, when he uh, made the analogy. Something else that's, uh, that's noteworthy is just how close Wilkie was to Roosevelt on many issues. So even during the utilities fight of 1938, um, he praised the New Deal. Um, he recognized that the New Deal was pulling people out of poverty, insecurity, and so forth. So what Roosevelt has actually done is shifted uh, what the federal government is supposed to do. So the federal government prior to Roosevelt was non-interventionist. Um, if you read economic uh, uh, straits, uh, the federal government wouldn't help you out. So uh, Wilkie believes in this. Um, and as again, as I say, it kind of shows that he's actually not very different. Um, uh, which is one of the problems he later has with uh, the Republicans. Uh, and as we'll see, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, after the election, um, he agrees with things like land lease, which isolationists really hate. I think it's, it's Churchill and Roosevelt deliberately dragging America into the war, um, which, you know, to be honest, isn't a million miles from the truth. Um, so in the Electoral College, it's a landslide for um, for Roosevelt. But actually, Wilkie uh, does pretty well uh, under the circumstances. Uh, it's the closest race since 1916. He polls more votes than any Republican candidate uh, before. Um, but what's also interesting and uh, contrast with the present is his reaction on his defeat. So I will try um, and share this on the role of a vanquished presidential candidate, uh, that once the president presidential race is over, uh, the person goes back to being a, a private citizen supporting the, uh, the candidate. Um, he talks in this clip, um, which I'll not show, um, uh, it's a continuation of that speech where he talks about what the opposition is for. Um, and he talks about the you know, opposition is for America, but it's still supportive of the president. Uh, and then this clip, I'll just show you uh, this clip is quite, um, again, a bit of a contrast from modern uh, politics. What uh, if America's going to look like that next Wednesday? Um, so, uh, yeah, things, ha things have somewhat changed uh, in American politics. So 
Um, I want to talk about uh, Wilkie, and this is one of the reasons I'm really interested in Wilkie, is um, his role in civil rights. Now, Wilkie actually is 20 years ahead of most American politicians in his attitude towards civil rights. Now, at this point um, in American history, the, the, uh, the black vote has only in the last four years shifted, or six years really, shifted to the Democratic Party. I mean, it's stayed there since, but up until 1932, uh, really until 1936 in presidential elections, those African-Americans who could vote, voted for the Republicans. The Republicans, of course, being the party of Lincoln. Um, and uh, Wilkie is trying to reconnect with that. Um, and I think this is instructive, uh, something he says to African-American delegates at uh, the convention, that they're going to get support, they're going to get help from Wilkie, regardless of whether or not uh, they uh, vote for him. Um, the Republicans also have a strong uh, Negro, quote, Negro plank. Um, in other words, their manifesto as far as it um, affects African Americans, um, which talks about um, the things that they're going to do. So economic and political square deal. Um, the, the Great Depression actually doesn't, uh, the New Deal rather, doesn't lift as many African-Americans out of poverty as you might expect. And African-Americans are, uh, maybe not quite as badly off as they were in 1932, um, but the, um, uh, the, the benefits of the New Deal aren't spread evenly. Pledge to end discrimination, civil service, federal government, and the military. Bear in mind, the military is still segregated at this point protecting the vote. Uh, so uh, the African-American vote in the South is minuscule. Um, some, some under 10% of African-Americans in the South are able to vote. And also combating mob violence, which is basically code for lynching. Uh, there were a number of anti-lynching campaigns in the 1930s, uh, which the Republicans sometimes got behind, but, uh, but the law was never passed. Um, partly because Roosevelt never intervened. Now, such was the concern in the Democratic Party um, over this. Uh, they had their first ever Negro plank. The Democrats preferred to stay quiet about civil rights because they were so reliant on white Southern Democrats. Um, Roosevelt was sufficiently worried to appoint the first African-American general and to, um, uh, to uh, issue a stamp commemorating Booker T. Washington. Um, so, Wilkie's kind of shifting uh, the conversation on race in uh, 1940. A couple of other things to point out. Uh, I'll talk to the, about the picture first of all. This is Joe Lewis, uh, boxing, world heavyweight boxing champion. And he was a Republican, actually campaigned for Wilkie. Wilkie came to one of his bouts and, uh, um, and uh, I think uh, Lewis gave him his gloves or they, they shook hands. Uh, so uh, this is probably the best known African-American in the country uh, in 1940. Um, and he's supporting Wilkie. Now, this is a kind of uh, a, a sort of throwback to pre-1932, where it was an anathema for African-Americans to uh, vote for the Democrats, who were the party of the South, the Klan, of lynching, the Civil War, the Confederacy, and so forth. Wilkie speaks in... Chicago and Harlem. I think he might be the first presidential candidate ever to speak in Harlem. Um, uh, Truman goes there in 48, um, but I'm not aware of another presidential candidate doing this. Uh, this is what he said in Chicago. It's not right that America should continue a practice in which the Negro is the last to be hired and the first to be fired. The Negro has little hope if he must wait until all the whites have been employed. Uh, and this kind of this sort of thing happened during the Great Depression, where traditionally black jobs, uh, African Americans would lose them, whites would take them on. They're always at the back of the queue uh, when it comes to uh, jobs in the war industries and so forth. So this this is pretty radical. He also says this: um, there'll be no discrimination between people because of race, creed, or color. The man who serves as my subordinate who makes any such discrimination shall be fired on the spot. Um, now, uh, critics would say that his record in the Southern and Commonwealth wasn't great, um, but he would argue that he, he did employ uh, quite a few African-Americans. Um, but the, um, 
the the symbolism of this, the optics of it, if you like, are really important, uh, particularly when we look forward uh, uh, to the rest of the civil rights movement. Um, the NAACP, the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, are really wary of Wilkie. Uh, they're, uh, they're supposed to be nonpartisan, but their leader, Walter White, is basically a Democrat who's supporting uh, Roosevelt. So they're highly critical of Wilkie. What they don't want is uh, Wilkie splitting the black vote, because the White argues that the black vote has the balance of power if blacks vote as a block. So they might not have many votes in, say, um, New Jersey or Pennsylvania or wherever, but they have enough to swing a close election. And if the vote's divided, um, it loses its, its ability to do this. And White actually refused to meet Wilkie before the election. <clears throat> Wilkie was from a, what's called a sundown town. In other words, a town where African-Americans are not allowed to stay overnight. And uh, some of the black press used this against him. Now, the first opportunity he got after the election Wilkie uh, met White and wanted to find out, wanted to meet this guy who wouldn't speak to him before the election. And the two actually became firm friends. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on. So Wilkie's a liberal. Um, uh, there are a couple of interesting ways to demonstrate this. First of all, in 1939, he condemns the Dice House and American Activities Committee, HUAC which later becomes uh, the vehicle for McCarthyism and the Red Scare. 1940, he publishes an article called Fair Trial uh, about the need for equality of treatment under the law, regardless of uh, your politics. And he accentuates this in 1943, when he takes free of charge uh, a case to prevent a communist called William Schneiderman being deported and actually succeeds. And a labor leader, Harry Bridges, said this of him. He's the only man in America who's proved he'd rather be right than be president. So I think this is really, uh, this, this demonstrates Wilkie's principles and he sticks to these uh, through the rest of his life. He's also um, the internationalist that I mentioned. 1941, the start of 1941, Roosevelt recruits him to go to London to talk to Churchill about land lease. Uh, now, Roosevelt, partly to uh, undermine the, the Republicans, appointed uh, several Republicans to key positions. Um, the Secretary of Navy, the uh, Secretary of War, uh, were both former Republicans who were basically run out of the party for joining, um, uh, joining Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, and uh, he does the same with Wilkie. So Wilkie delivers the message to uh, Churchill that uh, Roosevelt's keen to do land lease. Um, now, Wilkie, uh, 1942, uh, later on, uh, 1942, so by this point, America is in the war. Wilkie becomes a roving envoy for Roosevelt. He does a seven week tour across war zones. So he comes to the UK, he goes to the Soviet Union, he goes to China, he goes to North Africa. Um, he meets many of the key uh, leaders. So he meets De Gaulle when he's in uh, the UK. He meets Stalin, Chiang Kai-shek. He meets General Montgomery in North Africa. He comes back and he writes One World. Um, and it's one of the best selling books of the war. Um, one thing I, I found uh, that at the time it was the, the best selling nonfiction book ever, uh, but I would, I would need to check that. Now, this also highlights the schism that's developing between him and the Republican party. Um, this sense that, that Wilkie isn't a proper Republican. Um, partly because he goes during the midterm elections. So when he should be in America helping Republican candidates win back uh, the House of Congress and the, uh, the House of Representatives in the Senate, he's off gallivanting around the world at Roosevelt's uh, behest. Um, so I shall show you a little clip relating to this. So uh, concepts in one world. Um, 
uh, that are uh, the, the actually um, are really important in the the post-war settlement and um, uh, remain important to uh, to many respects today. Wilkie popularized the term one world. I'm not sure that he coined the phrase, um, but he certainly popularized it. Um, and uh, I think when you look it up today, uh, there's really no association um, or very little association between this term and uh, Wendell Wilkie. The book talks about um, the kind of world that Wilkie wants. And he's an anti-imperialist and he's an anti-colonialist and he's critical of Churchill, even though he is pro aid to Britain before America joins the war and a staunch ally during it, he's an anti-colonialist. He talks about the notion of world federalism and world peace, uh, a kind of sort of vague concept of not quite a world government, but something that, it, uh, that will become the United Nations. He's also uh, keen to learn the lessons of history. Um, he's someone among many who would argue that the reason that the Second World War breaks out is because of uh, the outcome of the First World War, not least the failure of the League of Nations and the failure of America to join the League of Nations. And this is one of the debates that's going on in America during the war as to what, um, what a post-war um, what a post-war organization will look like and whether America will be a member of it. Even though the Soviet Union is an American ally, he's concerned about Stalin's uh, intentions uh, in Eastern Europe. He's also concerned about the fate of China. Um, so China is fighting the Japanese and there's a civil war um, kind of bubbling under in China and whoever wins that uh, will establish China as a major power. And he talks about imperialisms at home. Uh, by this, he means racism, that America can't practice racism at home um, and criticize people for practicing it abroad. Roosevelt wanted Wilkie to head the United Nations and Wilkie refused. Uh, so, uh, yeah, again, another it's a kind of interesting counterfactual as what uh, that would have looked like. Okay, now, as I mentioned, uh, Wilkie was a bit of a, uh, an adulterer. And when he went to China, he met Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, now, the story goes that um, they were at some sort of diplomatic function and um, uh, the two of them sneaked off and then Wilkie came back to his room Later on, he basically did the walk of shame and uh, came back to talk, um, to tell um, uh, a journalist called um, Gardner Kyles, who was with him, that um, he'd basically got together with Madame Chiang Kai-shek. He wanted to bring her back to America, which his entourage thought was a really, really bad idea. Um, sort of coming back to America to be greeted by your wife with your new mistress in tow. Um, now, Madame Chiang Kai-shek did come to America during the war and she wanted to fund um, Wilkie's presidential bid. Wilkie was still thinking about a presidential bid in 44 and she was talking about funding it. She also later said this, um, basically she wanted the two of them to run the world. Um, so Wilkie was gonna run America, she was gonna run China and uh, uh, they would basically control the world. Um, so uh, not, uh, not an entirely well, um, uh, not an entirely well balanced um, uh, approach to um, uh, world politics. Um, but the story goes that she was uh, she was uh, infatuated uh, by him. Okay, just a few other things on civil rights. Uh, Wilkie supported all of these groups um, uh, who were advocating civil rights in the 1940s. Um, so National Urban League, Hampton Institute's a black college, desegregation of the military, March on Washington movement was a pressure group trying to get the desegregation of the military. He advocated fair employment practice, um, anti-poll tax and so on. He and White uh, went to Hollywood um, to try and tackle stereotyping in the film industry. Wilkie had uh, lots of contacts in Hollywood. 
and uh, it was a way in for him and White to try and do this, but really uh, nothing much changed um, uh, despite their efforts. 1943, summer of 1943, America explodes in uh, racist riots starting in Detroit. Now the upshot of this was that most commentators, most white commentators simply condemned the rioters and particularly African-American riot rioters. Wilkie took a different approach. Wilkie tried to understand what was going on, um, why these happened, what the underlying reasons for these for the riots were. And they're basically unemployment, lack of opportunity, racism, policing, all the things that we're, we're kind of uh, familiar with. He's also highly critical of the Democrats and his own party. He says that one party can't uh, uh, demand the support of African-Americans simply because Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves um, 75, 80 years ago. And the other party can't claim, uh, can't claim Amer African-American support when it has one set of practices in New York and another in um, um, Atlanta. He also reminds his listeners um, of their, their racism in that most of America's allies are not white, um, whether it's India or China or wherever. Uh, America is fighting for values that it's not upholding. 1944, he uh, appears at the NAACP conference. Um, I believe he's the first former presidential candidate to do this. Uh, 1947, uh, Truman becomes the first president to do this. Uh, most presidents have attended since. Um, and he's back on this idea of imperialism at home and abroad, um, that uh, Americans must challenge uh, uh, their own uh, racism. And uh, the, the disconnect between the American creed and the American deed is something that Wilkie highlights. Uh, White, by this point, um, is obviously is a really good friend of Wilkie's and commends this as one of the, the greatest speeches uh, ever. Nineteen forty-four, Wilkie is talking about another run, but he has he's pretty much burnt his bridges with the Republican Party. He runs in some of the primaries, but he loses badly in Wisconsin, uh, which is. A, a kind of isolationist stronghold. And as a consequence, he drops out of the race. He probably could have continued, but uh, the Republicans weren't gonna fall for uh, him stealing the convention um, uh, twice in a row. But undeterred, he wrote his own platform, uh, what the Republicans should be doing, and the New York Times published it. He also said, and this is where he's really far ahead, um, in terms of civil rights, is that if he was elected president, he would either appoint an African-American to the Supreme Court or to his cabinet. The first African-American Supreme Court judge was Thurgood Marshall, who was appointed in about 1967. Uh, and I think it's really until, um, the, not until the Clinton years that you have someone who's a full uh, cabinet member uh, who's black. And he says this to journalism, and he also says this, if I'm elected and I do not do this, I want you to write a piece saying that Wendell Wilkie uh, made such and such a statement to you and Wendell Wilkie is a liar. So he wants to be held to this if he is going to be um, elected president. Now, ultimately, when you look at um, this kind of historiography of Wilkie, uh, the suggestion is actually 48. He's thinking about 48 as a, uh, as, as, as a proper presidential bid rather than 44. And then we get into, well, what party is he going to be running for if he uh, runs in 1948? Is he still going to be running as a Republican or possibly a Democrat? Um, this is Wilkie's last published piece. It's actually published posthumously um, in Colliers in 1944. And again, it's very specifically about African-Americans and the injustice of segregation in the military at a time when African Americans are fighting and dying for America. And he thinks that this is the this kind of the worst indignity that African Americans face. And again, he condemns uh, both parties on race. Um, he says that there's nothing more democratic than a bullet or a splinter or shrapnel. 
um, that they, they, these things don't discriminate. Such is his popularity among African Americans um, that um, Walter White, uh, George, uh, George Gallup, who admittedly had a, a ropey time with polls in the 1940s, so we maybe want to take his uh, his predictions with a pinch of salt, uh, felt that uh, Wilkie could have taken the black vote from Roosevelt in a way that Dewey couldn't. Although actually Dewey had a good record as governor of New York on uh, civil rights. Pittsburgh Courier, one of the main African-American newspapers, uh, most of its readers wanted Wilkie as the presidential candidate. When Wilkie dies in October 1944 of a heart attack, um, the NAACP rename their headquarters in New York after him, but then becomes the uh, Wendell Wilkie Memorial Building. And just as an aside, uh, a photo here that this uh, African-American uh, man here is a veteran called Isaac Woodard, who was blinded um, by uh, a bus driver in South Carolina while in his uniform. Um, and here we have Walter White again. So Wilkie dies just before the election of 1944. He dies without giving Dewey um, uh, an endorsement. And actually, interestingly, again, back to counterfactual history, if he had won the election in 1940, he wouldn't have seen out, of, seen out his term. Um, and as we know, Roosevelt doesn't see out his uh, fourth term. Okay, to finish up, uh, a few things to, uh, to think about, to consider uh, with Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie is an anomaly in Republican po politics. And this is kind of best illustrated when he accepts the nomination and he talks about you Republicans. So if ever you want to get the, give the impression that you're somebody looking in in someone else's party, that's kind of how you do it. He wanted to realign American politics. Um, he and Roosevelt had some sympathy with this, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment, that uh, America, that the American political system was made up of two parties, um, which each had a conservative wing and each had a liberal wing, and uh, uh, the, they were they were competing with each other on the wrong basis. Now, this realignment doesn't happen until um, after the sixties, um, with uh, Lyndon Johnson's embrace of civil rights, um, but Wilkie is predicting it in the nineteen forties. There are tentative discussions um, between Roosevelt and Wilkie's people about Wilkie actually becoming Roosevelt's vice presidential nominee in 1944. Uh, and Wilkie, Wilkie turns this down. But they do uh, toy with the idea of a new progressive centrist party, whereby the Democrats can get rid of all the um, racist white Southerners and uh, the Republicans can get rid of the reactionaries, excuse me, the economic reactionaries, um, the isolationists, the people like Taft. Uh, but obviously this uh, never happens. He does have something of a legacy within the Republican Party. Thomas Dewey embraces a lot of what he advocates in terms of civil rights, and he puts some of it into practice as governor of New York. And in 1948, Dewey runs with the, really the best record of any governor in the nation on civil rights. He still doesn't win the black vote, um, but he, uh, he's part of what remains of the progressive, uh, particularly in New York, wing of the Republican Party. So, uh, and he starts to sound like Dewey when he talks about race and civil rights uh, in 1948. And this is my final point. Uh, my final counterfactual point is this. Had Wilkie lived, would the Republican Party and America more generally have been so susceptible to McCarthyism? Would they have accepted this idea that there are reds under the bed? Um, because there was really no figure of national importance speaking out against it. And it's hard to imagine uh, Wilkie embracing McCarthyism 
um, in the way that, say, Truman did, or a lot of politicians, and particularly in the Republican Party did, I think he would have been a voice of reason against this, and he might have perhaps even um, uh, 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 lessened some of the, uh, the, the negative consequences of uh, McCarthyism. So I will leave it at that uh, with just a plug for something that the university is doing.